think we should get started now. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Rehma Sufi, and I am a member of the International Marxist Humanist Organization. Um, uh, I will be facilitating our meeting today along with Jonas and Chris, who will be mostly behind the scenes. And on behalf of the International Marxist Humanist Organization, I welcome you to this discussion on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and our response. We are very glad to have you with us this Sunday. And um, we are dedicating this meeting to our comrades in Ukraine and the dissidents in Russia who are fighting for liberation. Um, before we start, I want to read briefly from our community agreements that we read before every meeting. Since we are in a space of radical community making, um, one mic, one voice, and we will kind of be <laughs> enforcing that technically. Um, no one knows everything. Together, we know a lot. This means we all get to practice being curious and humble because we have something to learn from everyone in the room. Asking questions, listening, and speaking are equally valuable. Be mindful of each other's personhood. We all have different backgrounds, cultures, and experiences, but we also come together as people. Please engage with each other in good faith and avoid making assumptions. Um, while our space is conducted in English, please be mindful that this dominant language is not how many people comfortably communicate. Please ask yourself, why am I talking? Consider whether or not what you want to say has already been said, whether what you want to say is on topic, or if there's a better time and place to say it. Uh, and lastly, respect the facilitator and their decisions. If there are any issues, um, you can private message one of the facilitators, which is uh, me, Rehma, Jonas, or Chris, and we will help you. Uh, with that, um, I want to um, uh, just give you a brief um, introduction to the structure of today's meeting. Uh, we will have four speakers speaking uh, for 10 minutes each, and then we will have a discussion for 30 minutes. Um, after that, we will have three more speakers uh, for 10 minutes each, and then another discussion period of 30 minutes. We, uh, we will be um, dis disabling the chat function during the presentations, but they will be open during, it will be open during the discussion period. And without any further um, delay, I would like to introduce Paul Mason, who is an independent journalist, filmmaker, and activist in Britain. I'll mute. <clears throat> Okay, you hear me now? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for that and uh, welcome to Friends on the Call. I explained to the organizers, I can't stay on the call for the whole uh, session because I'm still recovering from COVID and even just speaking for half an hour, just I just have to sleep straight after. So my apologies uh, for that. So I, I, went, I went to Ukraine um, in the week before the war broke out um, as part of a labor movement delegation from the United Kingdom, uh, to tr in defiance of our own um, foreign office advice not to go, because we wanted to try and, A, you know, investigate what was going on, B, not leave it to our own bourgeoisie, our own government, to, to control, gatekeep the narrative of, of discussions between, the you know, the West and Ukraine, and, and we wanted in particular to hear what working class people and progressives and human rights, and indeed the left, uh, the non-Stalinist left, what they wanted to say. And I'll try and throw some of the insights from that um, uh, into the discussion, uh, into what I want to say. But first of all, I mean, I just want to try, try and, uh, and I think this is, uh, this view of, of the world would be largely echoed by some of the left 
people we met in Ukraine and certainly by the workers' organizations. This is a just war of self-determination. Um, Putin didn't just invade Ukraine. Obviously, they invaded and, and annexed Crimea and the Donbass in 2014. Um, he didn't just invade. In, the, in justification of the invasion, he cancelled the Budapest Memorandum, which is a fundamental building block of the post-war cold, post-Cold War international law. It is a treaty lodged at the UN with the equal status to all other international treaties. And it, it basically said, the United States, China, France, and, the, and Russia guarantee the, the, the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine in response for Ukraine handing back <coughs> 4,000 nuclear warheads and giving them up. I mean, imagine, imagine what the world would have been like if it hadn't have done that. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good kind of counterfactual to start with. So Putin has not only ripped up this key piece of international, international law, cancelled the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine. Noticeably, noticeably, he makes no actual claims yet for territory he wants. He's simply saying <coughs> the whole existence of this country is cancelled. And indeed, he's... In, in numerous writings, including his essay last summer, um, declared Ukraine's nationhood invalid. Um, so this is something, this is, this is an imperialism or, 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 of an order, um, I think similar to that of German imperialism in, in the Second World War. In the sense, it, it, we're not seeing a colonialist country go to Jamaica and say, hey Jamaica, you're a subordinate set of people we're going to colonize you we're going to paternalize you uh, you'll still be jamaicans we'll still be english people it's saying you don't exist um and that's a scary thing when you realize that the that the ideology that has taken over and taken control inside the putin camarilla is the ideology of alexander dugin it is the uh, anti-humanist fascism of <coughs> of carl schmidt um you know Big, big, big spaces need needs single governments. Um, you, uh, all governments can only exist without heterogeneity. There can be no diversity in society. These philosophies are there in the mind of Putin, and they are what's driving it. It's what makes it a very dangerous form of imperialist aggression. It's also true to say this is an inter-imperialist conflict. The Russian imperialism, Chinese imperialism, European imperialism, and American imperialism have stakes in this. When we went to Kiev, we met railway workers who were telling us their wages and conditions and indeed jobs were being ripped up by oligarchs in Ukraine, <coughs> pro-European oligarchs and privatizing companies who are saying to them, look, this is all part of the European Union's fourth railway package, the liberalization. Uh, trade unions and, and kind of uh, co-determination are, are, are from the past. That's from the Soviet era. When we join Europe, your, you know, your jobs will be insecure. You know, there'll be no union rights. So it's very clear that there are inter-imperialist rivalries at stake. But for me, what subsumes these two things, which is the war of national self-determination and the inter-imperialist rivalry, is... <coughs> A systemic conflict. This conflict is part of a systemic conflict which has been declared by Putin and Xi Jinping in that uh, famous declaration, 4th of February. Those who haven't read it, really just get your heads down and read it. Um, it says universal human rights are over, international law is over, a single system of international law is dead. Uh, from now on, there will be multiple modernities. We will decide what democracy is. We will decide what human rights are. If we say Ukraine doesn't is not a nation, that's fine. If we say the Uyghur people uh, are not really a people, that's also fine. Um, there will be no international system. No, of course, in hindsight, and by the way, this is not a suggestion. It's not the kind of argument they're placing on the table. They've declared it and they have the power to declare it. Unfortunately, um, I think this war is the proof of concept of that Putin, <coughs> Xi Jinping um, declaration of systemic war uh, against democracy. Now, 
Um, we didn't choose it. The international working class, the left, progressives, we didn't choose that, um, but it's no here. And I think it characterizes everything else that's going on. Um, if, for example, if you look at Putin's draft treaties, the two draft treaties he's placed on the table in December for, to, for the West to take or leave, which are a statement of his war aims. It, it is shocking, really. It is, it is the neutrality and the demilitarization of the whole of Eastern Europe, i.e. the denatoization. And what follows that is the de-democratization, the reversal of any demo democratization of Eastern Europe. But read it as well. What he says is, going forward, Anything that the West does that challenges my security as the one man dictatorship, Russian nationalist dictatorship of Russia shall be subject to my veto. So this is not an offer of peaceful coexistence between ultra nationalist dictatorships and democracies. It's an offer of veto power. Which is why I think for me that the left's position flows from this. We have to support Ukraine's right to 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 to, to resist. Um, I don't think it's enough to call for Russian troops out, as some on the left have done. It means supporting their right to resist and their right to get arms from wherever uh, they can. I think the German government, the British government, have been right to send them arms. Um, Mars? This is Mars. Sorry? Uh, the, I think um, it's also we also need to understand that this doesn't stop in Ukraine. We're speaking to... Um, the youth organizations of the Party of European Socialists, which are the Social Democrats, they're working with a, one of the left groups inside Ukraine, um, which is the Social Democratic Platform. And they've been ferrying out huge numbers of people uh, and setting up activist cells in Germany, in Poland, of Ukrainian leftists and Ukrainian refugees. Those youth we're speaking to who live in Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, they are <coughs> already adopting forms of security in preparation for being invaded. You have to realize, there's those who are living a long way from this, that socialist youth, perfectly ordinary, non-revolutionary people, are now basically working in a semi-clandestine way in case it happens to them. So is it about NATO? Well, in part it is. NATO has expanded. You could argue that's unwise. Um, you could argue that the expansion of NATO, <coughs> as with the expansion of the European Union, was meant to be the expansion of free market capitalism into a chaotic space vacated by the Soviet Union. Uh, you can have a critique of all of that, but it's worth remembering. Um, and Michael McFaul, the former ambassador, pointed this out very, very succinctly, that Putin was fine with NATO expansion until revolts started to happen in the post-Soviet space. Armenia, Georgia... Belarus, Ukraine, several times. It, 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 it's the possibility of anti-oligarchic revolt that turned Putin and radicalized him into a <coughs> warmonger and a warrior. Um, and we all know what, I mean, they, the Russian chauvinists describe Ukraine as an anti-Russia. It's a very imaginative way of putting it. It is an anti-Russia in that respect. It is a part of the Russian space whose population have chosen to be European and Western and democratized and, and, and the, for the young, liberalized. Um, and whose nationalism, and there is some very pernicious forms of nationalism in Ukraine, but whose nationalism has become allied to the idea of Westernization. Um, and I think that is also what it's about. Now, last night, of course, Biden stumbled into this problem. The West has imposed sanctions um, designed to paralyze the, the Russian state over a period of months, but it, it won't, it cannot embrace what the logical conclusion to that is, uh, which is that the, the Russian dictatorship must fall. And we, the left, have no problem with that. I think it's, it, it's, it's, we need to have an argument with the, the Western liberals and the Western social democrats who are saying, well, you know, we don't want regime change. Of course, we don't want regime change imposed, and, and no one is suggesting. Indeed, NATO is avoiding conflict with Russia. But we on the left should have no, uh, no uh, compunction about stating that the end result of this has to be a revolution in Russia and Belarus. 
Thank you, Paul. I just, I just want to finish on the left. The, the, my big, of course, we, we will talk about the problems of a left, which is Stalinist, pro-Putin. Uh, they're easily dealt with. Their arguments are easily dealt with. My worry is a whole set of people are now starting to radicalize and define themselves around that argument that Putin is right, that Xi Jinping is right, that China's vision for the world is better than that of the West. That is now what we are up against. And we have a, a, a big part to play in that ideological struggle because we are the ones who know how to argue against that. The liberals don't. I'll finish there. Thank you, Paul. And we hope you feel better soon. Thank you for joining us, even though you are not well. Um, and now I would like to invite Rocio Lopez, um, who is also a member of IMHO, to please um, go ahead. Good morning, everyone, or wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Greetings. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes? OK, good. Uh, so I just wanted to start, OK. <clears throat> So the war in Ukraine is a classic anti-colonial struggle right now, which is something we haven't seen in a while. A uh, classic anti-colonial struggle against an imperialist aggressor. We're witnessing something unprecedented. I think the overthrow of a democratically elected government by a dictatorship through a full-scale military assault. We have seen democratically elected governments overthrown by military coups before with the clandestine assistance of other governments, but not this way where it's just tanks rolling over the democratic elected government. And this war must primarily be seen in the right of people to have self-determination and be free from imperialist aggression. So support for national liberation is a central aspect of Marxism. It does not only include supporting our fellow socialists and anarchists and other anti-capitalists, which would be pretty easy, but requires to support victims of imperialism in general. While we don't have to support every last national liberation struggle, we can't just support the pure ones, the purely left ones. A great example is that the international left does not require that Palestinians be perfect or get rid of PLO or Hamas's leadership in their states to support their struggle for national self-determination. At the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, even though I'm not a Leninist, I quoted Lenin on my social media. Lenin said, um, this is before he came to power, but uh, that Russian socialists who fail to demand freedom of, of secession for Finland, Poland, the Ukraine are behaving like chauvinists, like lackeys of the blooded and stained imperialist monarchies and the imperialist bourgeoisie. There should be no apologism in the left for Russian imperialism, period. Now, I read an interview with a Ukrainian socialist who wrote a letter to the Western left in New Politics. Um, this person, Taras Bulos noted that, quote, I think there's a structural problem in leftist thinking. It is obvious that an analysis that focuses only on the objective economic interests cannot adequately grasp what is happening, end quote, in Ukraine. Many more class reductionist Marxists have a hard time explaining what is going on in Putin's motivations because they are focused on just wholly like large economic factors. And they really have a hard time, ex they really downplay and have a hard time explaining like just basic human agency as a factor even though structural factors are structural, it's human beings still have agency. Something that I wanted to know just, um, that went largely unnoticed, but seems now to be like a big deal. It's something to pay attention to in the future. Um, last year in October, um, 10 warships from Russia, five Russian warships and five Chinese warships sailed around the main island of Japan, like between, so Japan has like four main islands. They sailed between the main islands called Honshu. They sailed between the northern island and the main island along the eastern shore of Japan, which is where the most population is. And they went back towards China between the, um, the main island and Kyushu. And this was just a big deal to like people who pay attention to East Asian politics. I didn't know this until after the Ukraine war started, but if I had known this, I would have been very much more on alert for Russia that Russia and China are going to escalate militarily. This is something they've not done before, and it just it's a signal that they're, but it's just something to pay attention to because right now China is really holding back from getting involved like in an alliance with Russia because they don't know how they feel exactly about it. But that's just something to know that they have mm -hmm. there are tiny little warning signs that they they are looking to escalate militarily. Especially China is really not it's really not been like Russia. It's not been so 
looking to get militarily involved um, outside of its sphere, but that's something to pay attention to. And just wanted to note, like, the last thing I'll say is I'm in my early 30s, and I was a toddler when the Soviet Union collapsed, so I just would, like, implore the left, especially the Western left, to try to stop analyzing the war in Ukraine or just whatever inter-imperialist rivalries are going on with Russia as just this continuation of the Cold War if it's like a part two, because three decades have passed, a lot of things have changed. Um, the big imperialist powers that are competing for influence, the biggest imperialist powers that are competing for influence around the world right now, particularly Latin America and Africa, are China and the US, not Russia and US. Russia still has its sphere of influence and is you know, very powerful, but if anyone's been spent a lot of time in either Latin America or in Africa in the last five years, you can see that that's China's there, like they're, they're the ones gaining a lot of influence. It's not, that's the Cold War that I've talked about before the Russian invasion. It's like this. And if you heard what the Obama administration said in the past, his pivot to Asia, he was like, yeah, Russia's the past, whatever. And he's like, really, we're concerned about China's growing influence because Russia is, it's very, Russia's very powerful, but even with this war in Ukraine, it's an empire in decline. Not, I should just also note the US itself. Not the country, but necessarily, but our military prowess is not what it once was. The, U the U.S. is empire is on the decline. We've had to pull out of two wars in the last decade. Why did I just pull out of Afghanistan? And, I, and that's all I really wanted to say about that. Just the cold, to me as a young person, the cold war analogies are, it's not that they're not relevant, but it's just things have changed. And I would implore the Western left to just view the things with a new lens and try to just stop thinking this is like the Soviet Union versus the US. Because a lot of things have changed. There's new imperial powers. Europe, especially the European Union, has like ascended. It's more powerful. It's like moved a little bit away from the US, especially during the Trump years. So thank you. Thank you, Rocio. Um, now I'd like to invite Mr. Gilbert Ashkar. Um, and uh, who is a socialist and a professor of international relations at the SOAS in London. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Rahma. Oh, one um, more thing, sorry. Uh, I don't know if the speakers can see me while they're speaking, but I'll be holding up five minute, two minute, and one minute warnings for you. Right, uh, it starts with me. Okay, <clears throat> um, um, yeah, I, I want to say first that uh, I think it's a good illustration of the, the great efficiency of Boris Johnson that uh, the two speakers based in England have both, uh, are, are both su suffering from COVID. Uh, after Paul, it's, it's me and I'm too, I too am <clears throat> suffering from COVID. We have a, a huge wave of infection here thanks to the crazy policies uh, implemented by, by the, the, this, uh, this government here. Anyway, so that's one, <clears throat> a way to say that uh, I too, I'm, 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 <clears throat> I'm suffering. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> so I, I will <clears throat> address the, this issue of, uh, of the nature of, uh, of, of the war. Um, yeah, I mean, Ross, you have just said that uh, this is uh, not uh, the same kind of confrontation that the one that uh, we, we, or at least the world was used to <clears throat> uh, during the Cold War. <coughs> uh, well, that's true. Uh, I mean, I would put it uh, somewhat uh, differently. I would say that whereas there was a room from a Marxist standpoint, to discuss the character of the confrontation during the Cold War, in the sense that there was room for a discussion about the nature of the Soviet Union, which some Marxist currents regarded as capitalist and therefore logically as imperialist, uh, there is hardly any room for a discussion from a Marxist point of view about the confrontation between Russia and, uh, and NATO in the sense that uh, uh, Russia, like NATO countries, is a capitalist country. 
and one which indeed uh, uh, presents uh, feature, political features, economic features, social features, which are crudest or uh, crudest, uh, 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 wildest, wilder, uh, um, which are cruder and wilder forms of capitalism that uh, what we have in the West and uh, a very authoritarian government. Just think of the, of the, of the fact that uh, in a few weeks of, uh, of war, uh, you have had over 15,000 Russians arrested. Uh, just imagine that in the United States, if you had the same, or in Britain actually for that matter, uh, against the war in Iraq. I mean, uh, imagine the, the, the British government would have arrested uh, 10,000 people or whatever. That, that, that's beyond imagination. So it gives an idea of, of, of the kind of regime that exists in Russia, which is a, a, a very reactionary regime from every standard, from every point of view, ideologically, socially, economically, and all that. It's indeed uh, further to the right than uh, the, the, uh, uh, the West, Western imperialist countries, uh, when you have a gradation here because in NATO, you may find also some Eastern European countries like Hungary, or for instance, uh, or, or Poland, which are uh, close, especially Hungary, to, to, to that model, the model you have, that you have in Russia. But Russia has it uh, in, in full and uh, without, uh, without constraints. So uh, it is an imperialist country. And uh, the invasion of Ukraine is uh, I mean, uh, really a textbook textbook case of uh, imperialist invasion uh, of, uh, of a, a country by, by, by another. Uh, um, uh, so indeed, in that regard, um, the, 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 the war that is waged by the Ukrainian uh, people uh, is uh, a just war, a war of uh, national resistance against imperialist invasion. And in that sense, it should be supported. And uh, uh, any, any attempt at uh, saying that uh, we support it, but we don't support uh, arms deliveries to the Ukrainian is it, just uh, uh, getting entangled into, into very obvious contradictions. Uh, if, if, if a people is waging a just war, it has to be supported. They have the right to get weapons from wherever they can get them. And just to, to end here on this point with uh, an analogy, if the United States invaded Venezuela and Russian imperialists sent weapons to Venezuela, I would certainly be in favor of these arms deliveries to Venezuela. Yeah, even though Russia is an imperialist country, and as I just explained, even more reactionary than other imperialist countries. So that's uh, uh, the, the, the first point. Now, the second point, of course, uh, here is that it's true that we have one imperialist country uh, um, engaged in war, and it is facing a whole imperialist block of countries, uh, which is NATO. Uh, um, in, a, in a confrontation that had been uh, escalating over, over the years. I mean, everybody knows that uh, what's happening today in Ukraine is, is not uh, just, uh, you know, uh, like a uh, uh, completely surprising event. It, it, it fits in a continuity with, uh, with what started in 2014. And even before 2014, there were <coughs> already <coughs> other, other such <coughs> events. Uh, so, <coughs> so definitely the fact that NATO <coughs> is supporting Ukraine <coughs> in this war is not because NATO is for any principles of uh, self-determination or democracy or whatever. Any attempt at portraying things in that manner, I think, is extremely dangerous. Uh, uh, NATO is doing that just for their opportunistic interests uh, uh, of uh, of uh, <coughs> of countering uh, the rival imperialism of, uh, of, uh, of Russia. <coughs> so there is indeed an inter-imperialist <coughs> inter rivalry behind that. 
And, and that's where I think you could see that I disagree with Paul uh, about this whole systemic idea. I don't buy it. Sorry, Paul. Uh, there is no uh, good and evil in this war. I mean, if we take the, not the war on Ukrainian, sorry, I mean, in this rivalry <coughs> between NATO and Russia, they are both <coughs> evil from, <coughs> from, our <coughs> from our point of view. Uh, uh, Russia is undemocratic, for sure, but the allies, many of the allies of the United States are not. Just look at those who are meeting today in uh, Israel, uh, uh, Egypt, Morocco, uh, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates with the Israeli state and, uh, and Blinken. Uh, is this a gathering of democracies? Is this a ga gathering of any systemic, uh, uh, you know, no. I mean, this is, I think, uh, very, dangerous way of, uh, of putting things. And when um, <clears throat> Biden tried a few months ago to, to organize a so-called uh, democratic summit, everybody laughed at him because it was ridden with contradictions. It didn't stand <laughs> any examination. That was a joke. So no, <clears throat> these are hypocrites on both sides. They are imperialists. They have their own interests. And indeed there is major responsibility for the United States in producing the situation in which we are now, in the sense that the United States has, in it, by its behavior, ever since the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States created the conditions for the rise of Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is the child of US uh, 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 <clears throat> attitude towards Russia. It's, it's the natural child of, uh, of that kind of attitude. And, and it's clear that for the United States, the existence of a, a bogey state, uh, if one could say like a bogey man, right? Uh, is, is something that fits very much in the, the US strategy of, of world domination. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, you had a whole, dis whole discussions about wow, where is the, I mean, the United States needed to invent an enemy, needed to construct an enemy. Well, they, they constructed one. And uh, that one is, is, is Russia, is Vladimir Putin, also China, but uh, uh, the, 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 the demonization, I would say, of Russia is, it's, uh, is at a, a different, uh, different level. So uh, in the same way that we have to be uh, supportive of uh, the Ukrainian people's resistance, uh, against Russian imperialism, including its right to uh, acquire weapons, and we should support their acquiring of defensive weapons, defensive weapons, not the whole range of weapons that they ask for, we should, and definitely not a no-fly zone or any such uh, demands that come from the uh, Ukrainian president and that uh, are I would say, say quite irresponsible because they, they, that would mean uh, uh, engaging the world <clears throat> in a dynamics that, that could lead to a, a, a world war of catastrophic proportions. So we are for the delivery of defensive weapons for this just war that is waged by the Ukrainian people. But at the same time, we are against the warmongering in Western countries. We are against the, you, you, the exploitation of this war on NATO side to uh, increase uh, military expenditure, uh, to uh, uh, overturn many restraints that you had in the past, uh, like in the case of, of Germany. And uh, uh, I mean, actually it is today when they say that Russia proved much weaker than they expected, that the, the, the Ukrainian resistance uh, uh, is achieving a real, uh, results and have uh, defeated uh, Putin's plans. Well, when they say that, and at the same time, they engage into this crazy, in, this frenzy of, of increase of military expenditure, uh, you, one can see the, the, the full contradiction. So we are completely against this, uh, this warmongering. We should be uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, the disarmament, uh, global disarmament, and also the dissolution of NATO, which is a military alliance, which was kept against uh, uh, the, 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 its initial purpose, 
which was countering the Soviet Union and uh, was turned into this tool of expansion of, uh, of US domination in the areas that used to be under the uh, influence or control of, of the Soviet Union. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we will move on to the last speaker for this part of the discussion. Um, uh, sorry, this part of the presentation. After this, um, after Chris speaks, we will have a five minute bio break and then a 30 minute discussion. Uh, Chris Ford is an activist with the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. Please go ahead. Thank you, comrades, for the uh, opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Rima. Uh, so where are we? I think it's important to begin with the, the recognition that the, the war in Ukraine did begin on the 24th of February. Uh, the war in Ukraine has been taking place since 2014. And the estimated casualties since 2014 to, to the recent re -inv uh, wider invasion are around 54,000 people. Uh, there's 14, 000, over 14,000 dead and uh, 39,000 injured. There was already 1.2 million internal refugees. Uh, according to the United Nations, uh, just a few days ago, we we're looking at uh, just around 2,500 civilian casualties since the recent Russian invasion began. But that, that's entirely inaccurate. We, we, we do not know uh, accurately how many civilians the Russians have killed. It's entirely possible in Mariupol uh, that they, they have killed, you know, thousands and thousands of people. We know that they've been burying people in mass graves, the Russians themselves, uh, and in other areas, the civilian services are concentrated in saving lives. Uh, buildings are destroyed, bodies are under them, and we don't know the, the full scale. Uh, the United Nations is now estimating 6.5 million internally displaced. Uh, displace. uh, half of the workforce is now unemployed. Uh, and there are 3.6 million refugees. Uh, the UN, in a forecast uh, uh, estimate, considered we could be looking at up to 50,000 casualties if the war continues. So this is a catastrophic situation. We are hour by hour, minute by minute, people are facing uh, the terrifying reality of violence being inflicted by a, a foreign army which has invaded the country. Uh, in the past several days, they've intensified attacks on, on several cities in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, and others with, with intense bombardments, with no regard for who the bombing uh, and deliberate targeting of, of civilians. And today, they bombed again, I'm sorry, yesterday, they, they bombed again Lviv in West Ukraine. But the, the war is one of paradox because simultaneous with this, there is a renewed resistance. And that resistance has been in Kharkiv and in, in north of Kiev going on the offensive. And this is significant. And that's where I would fundamentally disagree with any differentiation between what's being described as defensive and offensive weapons. Ukraine needs weapons which can drive the invaders out. That's what a war of liberation is. And, and that is crucial because, again, it's been revived today, the, and, and argued, including by the Ukrainian high command, that they expect Russia will partition the country and not seek to partition it along the original lines, but will seek to partition on a Korean model. Uh, should Ukrainians just simply stand back and defend what they have and allow their country to be further partitioned? I would fundamentally disagree with that. Uh, so what, I, want, I want to touch on the role of Russian imperialism on it before what, what I believe should be called for. And I disagree uh, with the view that the Russian imperialist aggression is simply a response to the West or NATO expansion. NATO hasn't expanded anywhere near Russia for nearly 20 years. The last countries were 18 years ago in the Baltic states. There's been no mass troop deployment around those countries. There's, there's no imminent invasion at this point of the Baltic states. Uh, 
Russian imperialism hasn't uh, and Russian nationalism hasn't fallen from the sky. It hasn't just emerged in in in, in the recent uh, decades. Uh, and in the recent decades, there has been a deliberate policy of expansion, of annexation, of aggression, and subterfuge, which relates to us uh, in the West. And uh, the war in Ukraine uh, and the civil war in Syria has shown us once again the significance of Russian imperialism. And it's something, it's re-emergence and reconstitution is something that uh, is an, a global development and large sectors of the left, of the global labor movement uh, has ignored this uh, and uh, not fully appreciated it. Uh, the economy of Russia uh, is like all other uh, large capitalist countries, uh, uh, a group of monopolies enmeshed with the state super rich capitalists who we know as the oligarchs uh, with uh, close relations with the state apparatus uh, uh, and the current ruling elite. Uh, it is one of the highest levels of income inequality in the world. Uh, it has a significant monop monopoly in gas uh, and energy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, also uh, the second largest nuclear power in the world and continues to be so. Uh, it has the largest military budget surpassed only by the US and China. Uh, and since Putin came to power, since they began the second war in Chechnya, uh, it's attempted further to restructure and assert its dominance. Uh, and we've seen this with the collective security and treaty organizations, the Eurasian economic community, uh, and uh, the closer economic and political blocs. And these have set about reasserting Russian hegemony in the territory of what was the Russian Empire uh, originally conquered and established by Russia. Uh, and we've seen them use energy blackmail and, uh, uh, deliberate, uh, and direct military intervention. We hear a lot of uh, NATO expansion, NATO encirclement. Within the territory of the, of the former Russian Empire, Russia has expanded and built military bases in Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Transnistria uh, uh, or, or Moldova uh, in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan. Russia has intervened militarily in Transnistria, in Chechnya and Kazakhstan. It's assisted the uh, propping up the regime in Belarus and it's waged war in Ukraine since 2014. Uh, 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 and we know of the, the, some of the, the, the war in Georgia. And what role, what role do, would argue does it play, particularly in, in terms of this situation? Uh, Russia was all defined in the 19th century as a gendarme of European reaction. Uh, it doesn't have the reach to, uh, or necessity to suppress democracy revolution in wider Europe, but it does perform that role in the territory of the former Russian Empire. And we've seen that most starkly in the suppression of the popular rebellion in Kazakhstan. That had nothing to do with NATO. Uh, in fact, NATO had been an ally of that regime, trained it uh, on it. Uh, it was to do with suppressing popular rebellion. The Kremlin will not tolerate on its borders any, any nation where there is a social or democratic breakthrough taking place, especially one that's been brought about by popular rebellion. And it does that not only from a strategic or uh, 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 more geopolitical point of view, but to sustain its own rule inside Russia. It will not risk that inspiration, that influence uh, uh, of undermining its own, the own position of the, of the elite there. And how does the Ukrainian question factor in that? Uh, Ukraine has a very special place in the mind of Russian nationalism. It was the conquest of Ukraine, uh, the conquest of the Black Sea and of the Black Earth Belt, the defeat of the Cossacks, that transformed Russia from a state of Muscovy into the Russian Empire. And that's crucial to Russian nationalism to this day. When they invaded uh, Ukraine, Novosti published the manifesto by Petro Okopov, uh, full of colonial language of the 19th century, the abolition of Ukrainians, the restoring of the, uh, of the Russian world. Uh, it's not coincidental that the Russian army are wearing white armbands. They are the heirs of, uh, of that imperial tradition. Uh, Putin is a guardian of that. He buried General Denikin with full military honours uh, uh, on it. There is a, so the, these delusions of some leftists that there's something progressive in this, uh, this force is simply delusions. It's not what they're saying. 
Uh, and how has been the response? The, the response to this uh, has been uh, uh, the total opposite. Russia has entered Ukraine with the arrogance of a colonialist, uh, with the uh, overestimation of their own strength and the uh, underestimation of the resistance. Uh, and that is what brought, has brought us to where we are today. There's many explanations for the uh, problems that Russians are in, corruption, lack of logistics. The one we should focus on more than ever is that, you know, a people empowered with the idea of freedom have beat the crack armies of the world throughout history. And that's what's happening in Ukraine today. 20,000 volunteers in Kiev alone, uh, backing up regular troops. Now, uh, in terms of what we should be calling for, uh, uh, I don't belong to a peace movement, I belong to a solidarity campaign. We want Russia to be defeated in Ukraine. And as such, we support, as with the left in Ukraine, the provision of all necessary arms to enable a victory. And that includes anti-aircraft weaponry, the tanks they're asking for, the air, the, 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 the mix that they were denied. Yeah, and uh, we want to see the debts cancel to help rebuild the country. We want to see the sanctions on the oligarchs escalated. Uh, and globally, we have a historic opportunity for a green transition away from reliance on funding a war regime in Russia. Uh, there are some of the main platforms that, that I would outline on this. Uh, if I'm, I'll conclude in this analogy. This isn't 1914. To me, this is more like the Spanish Republic. Uh, we need to pick a side. Uh, and, the, and the side we're on is, is those resisting Franco then and Putin now. And, uh, uh, and, that, and that means we want to win this time and not set a green light for further reaction across the globe. Thank you, Chris. Before we launch into a discussion on all our presenters, um, um, we will take a quick five minute bio break. And I think Chris has some music lined up for us. Me? We'll be back in five. <laughs> <laughs> Different, Chris. Oh, really? <laughs> Sorry. Do you want a DJ? <laughs> okay. 